morning uh, we're we're starting our series this is uh, week one of our uh, of our series letters from prison and uh, we're just going to talk today from the theme work it out okay Philippians is a book written by the Apostle Paul at this time in Paul's life Paul is in prison and uh, uh, un- under much uh, investigation many theologians believe Paul was in Rome when he wrote this, okay? And so the theme today of where we're going to be in the book of Philippians is work it out. And the takeaway of today's message is simply this. You cannot have the peace of God in your life when you have conflict with the people of God. Three words, work it out. Out. And as we look at today's theme, and as we look at Philippians, we're reminded of just a simple equation. Um, and that equation is joy in Christ plus unity in the body equals peace of mind. And conflict and peace, they do not go together. If you have conflict, you cannot have peace. And so when Paul is writing here in this book of Philippians, um, what Paul is really demonstrating to us, he's really concerned about God's body and about the body of Christ staying united, staying healthy, staying active, and staying alive. And and if you guys um, have been here for a while or if you know anything, um, this is our three-year anniversary of being a church plant, and we're so very gracious for one thing. We have an alive, healthy, functioning body. And, and, And if there's one thing that Satan, our adversary, wants to do is he wants to ruin that and he wants to wipe it out and he wants to create unhealthy problems. And so today and through this letter and through this series, we want to maintain integrity in God's word and we want to preach in a relatable way. And so regardless of where you're at today and what you're going through, I hope that this message will be easily applied to your work week, to your home life, and to everything else you're encountering because God's word is right on the spot every time. And so in preaching in integrity and preaching uh, relatable, we got to bridge this gap because we know that this letter that we're reading in Philippians, it's just that. It's just a letter. And sometimes when we read God's word, we can use it out of context without knowing content, all right? Obviously, as we've stated already, Paul is in prison here, okay? He's, he's not living a lush life, all right? And so we're in Philippians here. Paul had helped this church get founded. He was a missionary, and he's writing to people that he cares a lot about, and he knew these people personally. This is a very personal letter. Okay, and the theme once again in this whole series is letters from prison. And now if a guy in prison can stay encouraged, I'm pretty sure us in freedom can stay encouraged. So uh, recently I had the, the privilege of having my house bombarded with raccoons. And I can tell you, seeing these things caged reminds me of a lot of the ways that, that some of us live our lives, okay? We get ourselves trapped, and then we get mad and want to bite those around us, all right? And so the Apostle Paul knew a lot about that. He was behind bars for preaching freedom in Christ, all right? So he found himself at a point in life where he was uncertain, but he was willing to give it all, and he gave it all up until the point of being beaten, up until the point of being snake bitten. He had a shipwreck. I mean, he had an unfortunate life for the gospel, but the apostle Paul was all in. One thing that many Christians need to take note of in in modern Christianity in America today, we look at this guy's life and we say, hey, I want to be like him, but do we really? I mean, we're, we're very fortunate here in the United States of America. Do I really, would I really, if push came to shove, would I really give what he gave for the gospel? And, and so I want to start with a word of prayer, and then I want to just kind of unpack where we're going in Philippians, and I ultimately want to preach a message on working it out and, and, and just watch the exhortation in the encouragement and a couple things to watch for if you're watching this uh, online with us today. Um, Watch for explanation. 
Watch for the exposition. But be careful that there's also an exhortation and an encouragement as I go along in this with you today. That we could leave this thing encouraged and we could leave this thing on fire for what God wants us to do. Amen. So Father, I thank you for this time to preach your word. I thank you so much for all those online viewing this. And God, I just ask a special blessing this week. Uh, God, that we would be people not of conflict, but people of peace. And that as conflict, as Satan rears his ugly head, Father, we'd be able to distinguish and discern that. And Father, that we would know that you've created us to be at peace, to live at love with people. And God, I pray that that love that you first showed us, that we would exhibit to all we come in contact with. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in advance for the Apostle Paul's words in this personal letter that he wrote to this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, integrity is huge in God's word. And so I kind of want to get us to where we're at here. I want to say some things. We've already mentioned the author of Philippians is Paul and he is believed to be in Rome in prison in this time, okay? This is one of four. There are four prison epistles. This is one of the four. The other three are Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, okay? Philippians is a thank you letter. He's thanking this church for their generosity. It's got some common themes. The common themes are listed right here. Joy in Christ, unity in the body, and peace of mind, okay? And so the theme of Philippians, basically, it's joy regardless, a lot of people know this as Paul's joy book, okay? But, but we don't want to miss the fact that this was a personal letter to a church Paul loved. Paul loved these folks. Paul wanted to send encouragement to them. And so a brief outline of the four chapters we've been in, because if you're like me, I'm not a nerd. When I did the book reports, I flash, I flash forward to the end. I read the last little bit or the cover, and then I wrote, you know, the kind of theme, the right until you're right, okay? So I was the guy that wrote like five pages more than anybody else, but it was just because I was trying to pass, all right? And, and so if you're like me and you're not one of the, the, the booky kind of people, we're flashing to the end. We're going to see some things that were really important to the Apostle Paul. But we also want to maintain integrity of where we've been and what's brought us to this point, all right? So a brief outline of Philippians. Chapter 1 was all about joy and hardships. It's Paul in an uncertain time, and he's saying, hey, if I die, okay, that's good because I get to be with Christ, and I've seen him, and that's amazing and awesome, and I would love to be there. But being here with you guys, that's good too. Because I've got work left to do, and I'm called by God, I'm an apostle, and, and I want to be amongst you for fruitful work. So really, just like we all know today, I pray you know this, the Christian life is a win-win. We win. We're on the winning team, okay? And the Apostle Paul reminds us here, hey, it's a win-win. I'm good. He said, I've seen heaven. Remember 2 Corinthians 12? This apostle had, had a vision of the third heaven, okay? I want to debunk some myths. No, there are not places in heaven, okay? There aren't certain. We, the Bible never talks about these dimensions like some people will talk about. When he says the third heaven there, he's talking about the third heaven being the dwelling place of God the Father. Father. The second heaven being the sun, stars, the galaxy, the moon, the solar system, okay? The first being right where we're at here in good old blessed Warrington, Missouri. Well, not Missouri, but just where we're at here on the earth, okay? So he had a vision of this third heaven. He said, it's amazing. It's awesome. I saw Jesus. I was blinded. I had that bright light experience. That's going to be awesome. Jesus is great. We know this as followers. The end of our faith is going to be so worth it. That's what we long for. That's the finish line. That's the goal. He says the Christian life, in essence, in Philippians 1.1 is a win-win. It's kind of like this thing here. Yes, Creekside, second place this week at the kickball tournament. Tournament. We won't talk about the first place people because we're supposed to love them. I'm just kidding. It was a fun time, great time. I, I earned a good sunburn and a medal, so we're all winners, amen? But then chapter 2, chapter 2, Paul starts talking about this humility like Christ's name. Now, he was speaking to the divisive-minded people in Christianity, and he talks about not doing anything out of vanity or, or conceit or, or anything out of false motive. He says, consider yourself less than others. Be humble like Christ was humble, okay? And he started talking about how Christ lowered himself. He humbled himself. And we ought to too. And sometimes if we're going to work a problem out, if we're going to live the way Christ wants us to live, it takes us taking a step back and saying, okay, it's not worth it. It's not worth my peace of mind. It's not worth losing my joy. This conflict, I'd rather resolve it, squash it, be done with it, because I know Satan is a punk and he wants to wipe me out. 
The third chapter, Paul talks about warnings. He warns people of the Judaizers, there's a problem with doctrine and with beliefs and such. And he just says it ultimately towards the end of Philippians 3. He says, but for us as the church, for you online, for fellow believers, let's stay focused on one goal. We all have one goal, and that goal needs to be to edify Christ, not to divide something that is the body of Christ that Jesus bled for. The church is the most passionate outreach and extension of the love of God, and we need to maintain integrity and health in all that we do, and we need to seek to remain united, focusing ahead on one goal into which Christ has called us heavenward, like the Apostle Paul said, and part of that is forgetting what's behind you and looking ahead, okay? Don't let yesterday's problems impact today. Make a decision right now and say, from this moment forward, from this moment forward, I'm going to be the Christian I need to be. I'm going to be the example I need to be. I'm going to love like I'm saying, yeah, I made some mistakes. I'm going to, I'm going to confess those. I'm going to repent. I'm going to get right. I want peace of mind. I want the joy of Christ. I don't want the conflict. So I say yes to unity. And so the theme where we're at today is in Philippians 4, 1 through 3. Now that we got through all that, we'll be in, in this theme, a plea for unity. A plea for unity. Three things the Apostle Paul clearly addresses in the text. Point number one, brothers and sisters in Christ are our joy. Our joy should come from our fellowship with the saints and with our church family. And as one body when we meet, we should not create hardship. We should create help, love, and hope for one another. We should, we should live to long for the unity of the Spirit. And we should feel exalted. We should feel encouraged. We should leave here edified because we should love each other. He says right here when he starts writing in Philippians 4, he says, So then in this way, my dearly loved brothers, what a rich term. My joy and crown. He says, I love you guys. You're my joy, Philippians. I, I, get, I get pleasure in the middle of this prison cell just thinking about my love for you, about the work that we've done, about seeing people come to Christ through you, through the work you've done, through letting me proclaim my message when I was there, establishing this church. You guys are my joy. You guys are my crown. When I get down in this prison cell, I think about you. When I get down in life, I think about you. And shouldn't Christianity be the same way? Shouldn't we always be reminded of our brothers and sisters through the week? Shouldn't we focus on the joy and the positive and the uplifting of it instead of pointing fingers and saying, I'm mad at them. They did this. They did that. What is the deal with them? We need to be encouraged by our dearly loved brothers, just like the apostle was. Point number two, he says, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. He says, and at the end of that, he starts off, so then in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now, this is not an uncommon theme from the Apostle Paul. If you read any of his writings, stand firm in the Lord was very common. And what he's saying there is be on your guard. Be on your guard. Satan is a punk and he wants to wipe you out. Stand firm. Remember when these attacks come, when these problems happen, you're fighting against something different. You're fighting against the spirit of evil. It's not about a person. It's not about a conflict. It's about nothing else. It's about a Satan that wants to destroy you. It's about this evil work that's at, at pressing against your joy, against your peace, trying to rip you off from unity with people, trying to steal relationships. And you need to remind Remind yourself today. We all need to remind ourselves today. We're on the same team as Christians. We're doing the same thing. We need to be encouraged. We need not let anything come between us. We need to stand firm in the Lord. And he says, lastly, as we go into this, um, now, now, now think about this. This is an open letter. And there's somebody standing up and they're reading this letter to the church. And it's going to get really awkward here. Now imagine this, you're in church, and these aren't two common names, so I'm sure when they're reading these names, everybody's going to spin their head to see, where are these women? What have they done? He says, I urge Judea. Now you can imagine if you're in that church congregation that day, Judea, where's she at? What happened? What's going on? I urge. Urge is a strong word. I emphatically suggest. I, I plea. I beg. Judea. Hey, Judea, come here. 
And I urge Syntyche, hey, you and Syntyche, you two, bimbos, you couldn't get along, you couldn't work it out, you couldn't just do the mature thing, you couldn't do the Christian thing. Now it takes a letter from an apostle in prison to encourage you to do the right thing in God, really? Really, that's what it takes, Christian? He says, I urge Judy and I urge Syntyche to what? To agree in the Lord. Verse 2. I urge them to agree in the Lord. Your problem is solved every time when you put the cross of Christ right in between that problem. And you say, regardless of what this person's done, I know I've done far worse and far greater to my Savior, and he took the nails for me. And because he took the nails for me, I can settle this. I can work it out. I can walk in love. I can live in unity. I want the peace of mind. I want the joy in Christ. And I want to dissolve the conflict because I know to have that, we need to maintain unity in the body. And Paul is so broken here. These are two women, as we're going to go further into this, that Paul had labored with, that he'd known. He said, yeah, when these women were on, they were on. We worked together. We labored together. These women had gifts, and no, those gifts were not breaking up churches. You're never called. God does not send you somewhere to be a pot stirrer to be a, a disturber of the faith. You're called where you're called to use your gifts to glorify God, not to do the work of Satan, but Satan is a punk and he sifts us so easily. And so he says here as he goes along, yes, I also ask you, and now this is going to get personal between you and I, true partner. I want to be the true partner. Do you want to be the true partner? I want to be the one that Jesus Christ looks at and says, his heart is true. His allegiance is true with me. He wants to see my will done. He wants the kingdom done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When, when Jesus Christ looks at Pastor Steve Kohler, I pray that the measure of my heart is he wants to do my work. He wants people to come to me. He doesn't want to be a preventer. He wants to be a helper. He wants to be a server. He wants to be your doer. He wants to be a true partner. And if that's you and you'd say, I want to be a true partner, here's what it's going to take. Point number three, help these women and help others work it out. Work it out. You're called to show the love. You're called to be a mediator. You're called to preach reconciliation everywhere you go. You're not called to be the center of the problem. You're not called to stir up the problem. You are called to be a mediator, and you don't even hear it, by the way, until they've went to that person. If you're listening to junk, according to Matthew 18, that people are saying, and they haven't tried to reconcile with the person, you are at as much liability and as much fault as the person stirring up the conflict. Whoa, that's deep. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, help these women. Help them out, please. Help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side. They were right beside me, the apostle says. They were right with me, along with Clement, who you'll hear again in Philemon, and the rest of my co-workers whose names, whose names, listen to this, are in the book of life. These people are saved and they're not even acting like it, the apostle says. They have little conflicts over how short is too short of a mini skirt. Should we wear straps to church? Can we preach in shorts? Is it okay to wear a t-shirt? What could the problem have been? Because if it was that serious of a problem, we know from 2 Timothy 4, Paul addressed Alexander the coppersmith in detail over doctrine. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. And he opposed my ministry. Beware of him. So we know it wasn't that because he actually encourages that these women need to work it out because they're beneficial and they're useful. So what could this problem have been over? Was it because they didn't get a medal this weekend? Was it because they didn't get invited to play softball? Was it because they weren't the leader of the home team? Was it because they didn't get called on to pray? Was it because somebody said something so minuscule and so stupid it wasn't even meant to be a dig, but it was taken as a dig? What was the problem? Was it insecurity? Or was it just simply one of these women was looking to divide? Either way, at either rate, whatever the problem is, the apostle says at this point, this, this letter has been open. It's a personal letter. It's to the church. And now their junk is all the way out. But surprisingly enough, let me tell you something that does not surprise me. Probably everybody already knew about this junk. There's something about people that's really interesting that Satan does. 
Everybody usually knows about the conflict, don't they? Because people can't just work things out. They always got to stir it out and stir others up. There's something about that divisive spirit. There's something about that satanic divisional wedge that comes in between there, right? Where you got to be right. I got to have my team. I got to show people on my point where I'm coming from. And maybe that's what Syntyche and Udia were doing. At either rate, the apostle has called us today to work it out. Four things clearly truthful in Scripture all the way throughout. Four practical truths on conflict and maturity in Christ. Point number one, it should not take calling you out to get you to work it out. If it takes that level to where an open letter has to be written to, read to a church out loud, that these women would be encouraged to work it out, what kind of Christianity is that? The message is love. We know from Matthew 18, Jesus gives a checks and balances system. I don't know about you, but I like these because it says, hey, he's higher, I'm lower, okay, I'm going to follow his system. And he said, first off, if you've got a problem, you need to go to that person you have a problem with. And, and, and if that doesn't work out, you can't work it out, you need to take somebody with you. He doesn't say talk to everybody else. He doesn't say blab about it. He doesn't say tweet about it. He doesn't say Facebook about it. He says go to that person and resolve it. If you can't resolve it, get a conflict mediator. That's like a full-time minister or somebody that can be trusted. That is an average Susie homemaker, okay? You want to have somebody that knows the word of God. You want to have somebody that has stood firm in the faith, somebody that you can depend on seeing and accountable to Sunday mornings. You want to have somebody that's not going to be a one-side divisional person. Okay, so then he says, if that doesn't work out, find a mediator. And the most extreme of the extremes is taking it in front of the church, like is happening here, Udi and Syntyche, down front over something that could have been solved so easily. Isn't that the truth, though? It's always simple things that lead to bigger things when we allow them. Scripture tells us, number two, the, the second truth, in 1, 1 John 2.11, that the one who hates his brother is in darkness. The one who hates his brother is in darkness. 1 John 2, 11 right here. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If you've allowed yourself to have bitterness grow into a person and you look at that person with eyes other than love, you need to work it out. You need to solve the conflict. You won't have peace of mind. You won't have joy in Christ. And one of the things Satan wants, like we know, is for you to not work it out, to go unresolved into where you'll get bitter and you'll leave and you'll divide and you'll do all this crazy stuff and and then years down the road, it's going to end up being a, a, just a ripple effect of not healthy patterns. Point number three, the third practical truth on conflict and maturity in Christ. Conflict holds you captive. You're the one in prison. You're the one in prison because your ministry as a Christian is always reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. I'm not going to read it all right now. You can take a look at it at home. We are ministers of reconciliation, not division. Everywhere we go, we don't need to be a part of the problem. We need to be the salt and the light of the universe. People need to see us loving and living for Christ, forgiving others and putting fires out as they come up. Not even giving them things the time of day, really, because they don't really matter. They're just dramatic. And lastly, the fourth uh, practical truth is from Luke 17, 1 through 4, and it encourages us to stay away from being a stumbling block, okay? And be ready to do three things, rebuke, accept, and forgive, and to never make up your mind today, I'm not going to give up on my brothers and sisters in the Lord. It says it right here. We are not to give up on somebody, okay? Luke 17, 1 through 4, reading here, Jesus speaking. He said to his disciples, offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one they come through. It would be better for him to, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus here isn't speaking about toddlers. He's not speaking about kids. He's speaking about new believers in Christ. And as mature Christians, we need to remember as people of faith, period, that our example and how we respond says a lot to people. It can either stir people away or it can stir them up to see the love of God. He said, be on your guard. There it is again. Be on your guard. Why? Because Satan's a jerk. He's stirring up conflict all the time. He wants you to be unforgiven. He wants you to be unresolved. He wants you not to have joy in Christ. He wants you not to have peace of mind. He wants to ruin your week. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin everything. Okay? He's a ruiner. He's a destroyer. Be on your guard then. If your brother sins, what are you supposed to do? Rebuke him. That word means to show disapproval. It's okay to tell to have that talk with that person. Be gentle in it though. Hey, what, what you did, it hurt me. I, I can't believe you would do that. 
Why wouldn't you just return my mini skirt you used in eighth grade? Okay, not my mini skirt. And if you're watching online, I don't wear mini skirts. But these are the kind of things that, that stir up problems and they don't need to. Okay? Show that disapproval. Show how it hurt. But also don't speak if you're not going to encourage. Don't just speak to speak because you're bold. You're not bold. You're an idiot. It sounds like you're an idiot. You're, it's like you're talking to a wall because nobody's receiving your junk as you spew it. In love, explain what happened, explain the solution, explain why it bothered you, but also explain scripturally so it will edify Christ. And he says, second, accept. And if he repents, forgive him. Accept his apology. Accept that fact that they made a mistake, okay? Accept it for what it is, okay? And the, by the way, this is the only time in God's word where it says that if he repents. By the, a lot of times, you're not going to get an apology. Deal with it. Be humble. A real forgiveness, a real level of maturity in Christ is being able to forgive even when somebody doesn't ask for it just automatically like Christ in heaven has forgiven us, okay? So when we do this, you need to live life knowing people will fail you. I will fail you. Everybody's going to fail you. It's ultimately up to you you to keep that peace of mind through joy in Christ and keeping conflict out of the body of Christ, okay? And lastly, he says to forgive, right? Forgive him. And if he sins, verse 4, Luke 17, Jesus speaking, if he sins against you seven times in a day, that would be really annoying, by the way. Like seven times in one day, like you come up and kick somebody in the head, hey, I'm sorry, you come back, karate chop them, hey, I'm sorry. Well, it's kind of extreme, but seven times in one day, after about one or two, that's going to be tough. But Jesus says right here, if he sins against you seven times and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Not you can, not you should, not you might. You must forgive him. Scripture commands forgiveness for the offender. Why? Because you and I are the offender. We're the offender that didn't deserve forgiveness, but because of grace, Jesus Christ laid it all down. And so Philippians 4, 1 through 3, in a nutshell today, has basically said this to us as this open letter has started to be read in chapter 4 as we delve through this the next four weeks in chapter 4. He basically has said this in one sentence. We are called to be the light, and light outloves and outlives hate to show the love of Jesus regardless. Work it out. Be the one this week. Make up your mind as you read this letter from prison, as you think about this apostle in prison who gave it all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Make up your mind to say, you know what? I want God's way. I don't want mine. I want my heart to be examined this week. I want to be right with God the Father. And ultimately, I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a, a conduit, a, a blessing, a fountain of love everywhere I go. I want to be a vessel for God. I want him to be able to flow freely. And part of that free flowing is remembering this equation this week. Joy in Christ plus unity in the body equals peace of mind. This is Philippians. It's began letters from prison. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time today. Lord, I pray that, like always, if there's anybody online that has not made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that's where it all begins. Jesus, you died for us. You died for all of our sins, not just some of us. We're continuously forgiven over and over and over through this thing called grace. You died in our place. You were buried in a tomb. You shouldn't have been able to get up. It should have been impossible because the power of God and the Spirit of God, you were rose from the dead, Jesus. We know this and we believe this. And because you raised from the dead, we will live the victorious lifestyle as Christians. We too will resurrect into a real place called heaven, which John 14 says you're preparing for us. You've got a home for us. Our hope's in heaven, God. We believe this as Christians. This is our belief. Jesus, it's all about you. We want to do your will. We want to be a blessing this week. Help empower us to live life in a way that we would always work it out and we would not live at odds so we could have peace of mind, live to see the joy of Christ in our life, and keep the you unity in the body of Christ because this church isn't four walls, sounds, lights, and entertainment. It is the body of Christ here on this earth to be loved and to show honor, praise, and glory for the one who called us. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you, and, and we give you all the glory today. Thank you so much for forgiving us and for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.